Hey everybody, on this week's video, I'm going to show you how I've enhanced my cave terrain tiles that I made in a previous video to add a little bit more variety with some water tiles. Now to do that, I'm going to take some MDF board that's about 6 inch by 8 inch and about an eighth of an inch thick. I'm going to take my contractor blade and I'm going to bevel along and make an oblong shape that's going to be used for the base of creating this. Second. I'm going to take some of my leftover foam. I, I have a tendency to save this from previous projects whenever I use the hot wire cutter. And I'm going to recycle it into this piece to make the outside edging frame where the water is going to be held. Now, to be clear, you can use any kind of clay, like a modeling clay compound. You can use spackle. Any of those would work. To reduce the cost, I'm going to use some leftover foam because I already have it. It doesn't cost me anything, and it helps just kind of recycle things a little bit and, you know, be earth-friendly and whatnot. So once I outline the frame of the pool, I'm going to use some tacky glue to glue these all into place. One thing that you will want to do is leave a little bit of space between the edge of the MDF board and where you're placing the foam. That's going to be important because when you go on to the next step, after all of this dries, you're going to take your putty compound, whatever it might be. I like to use a wood filler compound, and you're going to lay it over the foam. It doesn't really matter what size foam you use. You're just creating a rough outline, and then you're going to shape everything once you put the putty on. Now that it's all dry, I'm going to use my wood putty here. And I'm just going to start putting it generously all over the foam pieces and start molding it. One thing that I didn't do in this was add a little bit of extra water into my wood putty pot, which would make it a little bit easier to mold. So you can see here that it's a little bit sticky on my gloves, and it's making more of a mess than usual. If you add a little bit of water either onto your gloves or a little bit into the actual pot and mix it up, it'll be a lot easier to mold and to shape. The reason that I like to use this wood compound is because it also has a really good texture to it when it dries and it matches my existing cave tiles today. So I'm going to go around this whole thing. I'm going to add in little bits and pieces of it on the sides, rub it down uh, with a little bit of water on my finger and smoothen the edges out. Next, once again using some of my leftover foam, I'm going to take my blade and I'm going to start to make the stalagmites that are going to go along with this. I'm just going to start whittling them down until I get a rough stone cone spike shape, and I'm going to do this a handful of times. Now, it doesn't really matter how you go about doing this, as long as it's shaped somewhat like a spike. You're going to want to do this a few times to make varying sizes. Variety is key in this case. And once it's all in place with the wood putty, it's going to make a very natural stone appearance. Now, doing the same thing, I'm going to use the wooden dowels that I've used in my previous video. And this is going to make much longer, thinner spikes. So I'm just going to take a few different sizes of these wooden dowels, whittle them down to a rough point, and then clip them with my clippers to make the secondary set of spikes. Now, once this is all done, you're going to glue these spikes into place, and then you're going to go over them again with your wood filler and then let it dry. And that is going to give you your final base piece that you're going to use. This is the final product prior to priming it and getting it painted. I will say I use the same priming method I use for a lot of my terrain. I typically will spray on a black base primer. Then I will go over it in splotchy brown and then go over it in gray. Now, if I did this properly, I wouldn't really need to wash the piece. But because I went a little heavy on the gray, I decided to use some washes. Now, I'm using two homemade washes, one brown and one black. And what you're going to want to do is generously kind of dump them all over the piece and then tamp your brush around uh, to fill in any of the details so it'll capture it. You don't want to use your null oil or any of your expensive washes for this because, again, it's terrain. You're going to use a lot of it, and it's very expensive. It's much more cost-effective to produce your own washes uh, for terrain pieces specifically. 
I will say that I did end up using one store-bought wash, which was Chthonian Camo Shade, and I used that because I wanted the green mossy effect to go around the spikes in the center of my piece where the water effect is going to be, and it just makes it look more natural, like there has been a little bit more uh, random algae growth. Uh, oh, and then I totally knocked over my pod, which happens a lot, unfortunately, with Citadel paints. Uh, but no matter, I just took the little spill mark where it spilled, and I continue to use that around the piece. Now, you'll come back to this a little bit later and add a little bit more wash to it when it's all said and done, but this is going to help solidify some of the bits that are going to be covered under the water, and you just want to prepare to get that stage done uh, and let that dry before you move on to your resin. Once your washes have dried, we're going to go ahead and start painting in the center where the water is going to be. And to do that, I'm using three colors. I'm using uh, a dark blue, I believe it was Cantor Blue by Citadel. Um, I'm using Abaddon Black and uh, Mornfang Brown. So any brown, black, and blue should do. Now, in deep areas where the water is supposed to be at its highest depth, you're going to want to use the blue and then start blending it in a little bit with the black. As you get near the perimeter or around the spikes, you're going to want to do that in brown. As you go around the edges, you're going to continuously tamp the brush and it's going to help you make a smoother transition in your colors. So you're going to go from brown to black to blue to black and just continuously fiddle and tease it until you get a nice smooth transition. You don't want clearly defined paint lines making your piece uh, look unrealistic. You want to keep tamping them until you get them nice and smooth and blended together. So once that part is done, we're going to go on to the dry brushing. To use this, I'm just going to use some cheap acrylic white paint and I'm going to mix it a little bit with some khaki. This is going to give me a nice off-white color. You want it to be more on the white side than khaki. And you're going to take your dry brush, wipe it off on a paper towel or something to help kind of wipe off some of the excess paint. And then you're going to very aggressively go over the entire piece uh, with this off-white color. Now you're really going to start to see because we used the wood putty that it's going to pick out a lot of the detail and just make it look really defined and sharp. So this will match the rest of the tile pieces that I produced in the last week's video to show you uh, A, lots of definition, and B, if you want to add in any more washes later on, if you want to make this thing look gunky and dirty, it's easy to add that on on top of the dry brush effect. Make sure that you go over all of the spikes and you don't want to go over the water where you just painted in the center. Just hit the spikes in the perimeter and then leave the area that you painted because that's going to be covered up here shortly with the resin. So now we're going to get to the part where we're about to pour our resin. Uh, in this instance, I am using Art and Glow resin. It's a two-part epoxy resin. You mix it by volume. Different epoxies have different ratios. Some are by weight. So in this instance, they're an equal part of measurement, hardener, and the resin material itself. If you don't do it correctly, it won't cure right. It'll make a terrible mess, and you will ruin your piece. Uh, I will say that this is something that I am not as proficient in. I am still learning how to use resins appropriately and all the cool little techniques that go along with it. Um, but this is a very easy one. Just pour a little bit of each in equal distribution, mix them up slowly for about two to five minutes or so, uh, and you want to reduce the amount of air bubbles, so don't mix it too aggressively. This clip is sped up, so it looks very aggressively, but I was actually going pretty slowly with it. You can also add in some dye or paint, whatever pigment that you want. In this instance, because I painted the bottom of my piece, I don't need to worry about that too much. So I'm going to pour in the clear resin and it's going to take on the color of what's set underneath. Take your popsicle stick and start mixing it and spreading it all around, making sure you cover all of the pieces that you wanted with your resin. It's self-leveling, so you don't have to worry too much about it. Now, I've taken it off screen here, but I'm blowing on it with my breath and that's gonna help pop the bubbles. The CO2 in your breath will help pop the bubbles on the surface and it will help it so 
if you don't have too many in-depth bubbles in there, it should dry nice and clear as you can see here. Once this is dried, and I would say give it at least 24 hours, sometimes a little bit longer depending on how thick the resin is that you're pouring. Once it's dry, we're going to take our Chthonian Camo Shade once again, and we are going to go all the way around between the water and your spikes and the perimeter, and this is going to help solidify that wet, stained, mossy effect that you're going to have on your piece. It's okay to go a little bit heavy with the Chthonian Camo Shade. Just make sure you're not getting it all over the resin that you poured. You want to make sure you're limiting it to just the spikes on the bottom halves and kind of fan it out a little bit so you don't have any clearly defined lines. You want it to blend almost seamlessly between the outer perimeter and the water itself. Don't forget to go all over the outside of the rim as well. Pretty much anywhere where the water is touching, you're going to want to add some Chthonian Camo Shade. Now, if you don't want your piece to look like it's mossy or wet, you can always go over it with a brown wash of some kind, which still gives it that worn effect without the look of having life or anything like that. And there you have it. When it's all said and done, you'll have a really nice, realistic looking cave terrain water pool to work with. This adds a really nice bit of variety into your terrain. This is something that's really simple and easy to make, and you can make it in an afternoon, really, once everything dries. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know by giving me a like and a subscribe. I try to make videos on a weekly basis, so if there are questions or comments that you have, let me know in the comments section down below. You can also check out miniaturemarauder.com where I do write-ups of all of the video tutorials that I do. And of course, I will try to make sure I have all of the relevant links listed below in the description. Thank you all again for taking the time to check out my video. Happy crafting, and we'll see you again next week.